to symbolize the opening of today's ceremony, I would now uh, like to request our chief guest and the guest of honor for the lighting of the lamp. Good morning, delegates of National Academy of Psychology. Our Department of Applied Psychology welcomes all the delegates. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh. Honorable Guest of Honor, Professor Suhas Chandra Parija. Uh, Professor Meva Singh, sir. Professor Manas Mandal, sir. Professor Narayan Srinivas, sir. Madam Sonali De. And my colleague, Dr. Barnikant, other colleagues, other dignitaries present over here. So there is a hearty welcome to all the delegates over here. So when we proposed for this conference uh, last year in uh, Delhi Convention, it was happily accepted by the uh, executive body of National Academy of Psychology. With that, we started with this conference. This is the 29th annual convention of National Academy of Psychology with the theme, Making Psychology Deliverable to the Society. All of us know developing societies like India inevitably lack material resources required for various domains of social development. Therefore, it becomes imperative to utilize the available psychological resources optimally and judiciously. Moreover, within a particular society, there can be sections which are exposed to greater, de greater degree of deprivation, maybe economically, socially, behaviorally, or culturally. Thus, it becomes incumbent upon the psychologists to identify the ways and means to motivate these groups for growth and development. The psychologists have to mobilize as well as utilize psychological resources like abilities, skills, and motivation of the individuals. In addition, since the inception of psychology as a sovereign field, its outreach to public should be realized to the expected level in spite of its significant promise, in addition to its significant promises as behavioral science. All of us know the youth in our nation as well as in other countries are becoming very vibrant now. Their size is increasing as well as their access to technology. Sometimes, and in some part due to lack of proper channelization of their energy, they are exhibiting undesirable behavior, whether in the form of stone pelting, sloganeering, or other antisocial activities. We have to check out the ways to use both reinforcement as well as punishment so that the youth comes in the mainstream and become entrepreneur rather than a misguided antinational. The psychologists need to suggest concrete pathway for this. Then with this, this let us come for this conference and sessions. And this against this background, this conference and has been arranged. Uh, we received many uh, abstracts through uh, blind review. Uh, so we have come down to it come down to 320 oral presentations and 185 uh, poster presentations. Uh, we are having 32 sessions. We are having uh, symposiums, 12 symposiums. We are going to have invited talks and one uh, plenary symposium, just followed by this inaugural session. So again, our Department of Applied Psychology welcomes all the delegates and all the dignitaries over this task. Thank you all.
a very good morning to all of you on the occasion of 29th annual convention of national academy of psychology and the international conference i am here right now to say a few words about now uh now you know is a prime body of psychologists in india and its objectives are to promote psychological science in terms of research teaching and professional activities in india we are regularly having annual convention for last Uh, including this 29 years and now publishes a premier journal psychological studies published by springerling the journal provides a very good platform for research scholars to publish their work and reach the international academia now this regularly also publishing a newsletter for uh, this is the before the, this convention we published the fifth bulletin of now there you can get a brief outline of whatever now is doing throughout the year during the last year a number of very good books were published by now members Uh, articles were published by now members in reputed journals workshops seminars were conducted in various parts of india research projects were carried out by now members and many awards were won by now members you can get these on the now bulletin in the international arena now has made further progress during the past year i mention the most important few here professor purnima singh represented now in a symposium at brics in moscow in 2019 professor prakash padakanaya has been elected executive in the executive committee of international union of psychological science and professor purnima singh and professor narayan sunibashan will be now delegates uh, to uh, iups three now members professor punnima singh professor saswata narayan biswas and dr tusha singh have been elected as members of the board of directors uh, in the international association of applied psychology this year we know the international union of psychology conference icp to 2020 will be held in prague next year and now will be represented there in terms of three keynote addresses uh, the keynote speakers are professor ajit mohanty uh, professor narayan srinivasan and professor nandini singh and now we is also organizing three at least three symposiums uh, symposiums there Professor Girishwan Mishra will represent NAOP in a symposium to be organized by Asia Pacific Psychology Alliance at ICP 2020. Coming back to home, coming back home, uh, NAOP has plans to organize many programs, workshops this year. Specifically noteworthy is introduction of NAOP Arts program. Advent, advanced research and training program uh, i'll it will uh, will organize it to encourage young research scholars to get trained in getting projects in conducting research and all that you will uh, get it uh, get the uh, communication of this in now website with this brief communique on behalf of now i would welcome you all to this three day annual convention of now and the international conference i wish to thank pondicherry university the honorable vice chancellor sir 
administration of Pandicherry University, Professor Sia, HOD uh, Department of Psychology, and his colleagues, and the research scholars and students for, for putting this excellent effort to organize the conference. I wish the conference a grand success. And before finishing this brief talk, I would invite all those present here, those who are not yet members of now, to get your membership. There is a membership desk outside throughout, uh, through all these three days. So get yourself associated with now for the coming years. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am, for briefing us on the outlines of NAOP. We have our chief guest address now, Professor Gurmit Singh. He is our vice chancellor, and he is a reputed expert in the field of corrosion chemistry and nanofilm deposition. All the curious minds would have Googled who our vice chancellor is. But for those who have been a little lazy, I'll just give you a snippet of uh, uh, the profile of our vice chancellor. He has held the positions of proctor of Delhi University. He had been the principal of uh, this Bandhu College, Delhi, as the OSD of uh, Delhi University. And he has, has also served on many high-level committees of UGC and CSIR. Together with that, he also is a member of Royal Society of Chemistry London and also the National Association of Corrosion Engineers US and many others which I think you know uh, will take too many uh, too much of our time to read everything that he has achieved so uh, to in order to save time I would uh, now like to invite our honorable vice chancellor to give us the chief guest uh, address thank you for very kind words about me and a very good morning to all of you it is one of the rare occasions when I'm seeing this auditorium absolutely jam-packed with some people standing at the back. I think nothing can be more satisfying than this. Uh, this speaks in volume about the vibrancy of uh, the psychologists who have been all here from all over. Well, uh, my dear old friend, Professor Subhash Parija, who is the Vice Chancellor at Balaji Vidya Peet, uh, Professor Sonali Day, Professor Meva Singh, Professor Narayanan Srinivasan, Professor Manas Mandal, and uh, Dr. Barani Kanth, and finally Surinder Sia, our HOD, who has been doing a remarkable work. And uh, I would share this with all the persons sitting here. I would especially mention uh, our friend here, who was handling DD earlier, but now he's been given the Visitors Award. I would like you to stand Day. And uh, there was a visitors conference on 17th where he was specially recognized and was given the visitors award, again from uh, this department, which speaks in volumes about the vibrancy of this. A uh, few days back, there was a conference on uh, some economic features. And uh, uh, there, was somebody said, it's a, it's a conference of economists. And I said, yes, I know economists. They are the ones who, who, gets, who will get richer by telling why you people are poor. So here, a heartening feature is all the psychologists have been here. And psychology is a subject which helps you in exploring who you are. Unfortunately, in our society, we are not able to explore our own self. And because of this, we are not able to deliver to the society. If we know who we are, and what is our hidden potential, what is our capability, what way we can render the best service to the society. I think society will be a far better place to be in. But uh, as I said, we believe in religion, we believe in a lot of conventions in our country. It's a land of diversity, it's a land of religion, it's a land of all kinds of practices. But then, we believe in religion and the practices in a very loose manner that yes, there's a temple, I have to bow my head. That's about it. Th that part of religion, if you look at it a little deeply, and if you, if you date back psychology and religion, you know, they will all converge at one point. It, it both will help you in exploring who you are. And that's what I'm emphasizing. This is one of those best subjects which is needed these days in practically all areas. 
and this is something which came up very late in our society now also it's required everywhere but then you don't find psychologists taking the shape everywhere on the other side what what we have in most of the corporates and most of the companies is hr experts whereas in my opinion it is the psychologists who need more and i don't know i will i can always share that i had the best of relations when i was in university of delhi for a very long time i had the best of relations with all the psychology staff members and uh, through my interactions with them and through uh, various uh, discussions that we used to have i could handle the students problem uh, for a very long time uh, i served as a proctor for good 10 years and they said well he is able to do this thing because he maintains a wonderful relation with the psychologist that's what is required in our prisons we need them for defense officers we need them we, for policing we need them you name an area where this is not required but unfortunately there was a time uh, still people are hesitant when somebody goes to a psychologist though one gets immense benefit out of that but in public he would hesitate to show or to say that uh, i was with a psychologist they'll say well he is in the company of psychology there is something wrong with him that's the that's the perception that the society has we are not very open let me tell you i am telling that the the psychology is required practically everywhere and this is uh, the time when we need to spread this subject much better much more openly and uh, unfortunately i think i'll leave it uh, to to ponder over uh, for the house here that why is it that psychology is being taught only from the college level onwards not even college level in fact at graduate level you will find very few institutes take a survey you will find that very few institutes will have psychology as one of the subjects you will have all other subjects but not this very few colleges in our country will be teaching this and when they start teaching it they'll say that we will start this in the uh, fag end of the graduation third year onwards why not from the first year that's the time when which is the formative year of a college student where this is required so probably you need to discuss and recommend it to the higher authorities higher authorities means uh, the the administrators ugc mhrd whatever to recommend that this is a subject which is needed all over and this needs to be expanded and it should be a part of the curriculum at the graduate level normally what you find is one will do sub graduation in any subject and ultimately he would come to the masters level where they will think of uh, studying psychology i think those students who have taken this subject at an undergraduate level i don't know whether there has been any kind of a comparison uh, so far or not but if you carry out a comparison like this you would find at least i have noted that during my interaction and during my conduct of the interviews that we conduct at uh, upsc level at higher levels we find that a student who has come from this background is definitely a better person than the one who comes from other background but then as i said there are very few who would do this at the uh, formative years this is one of the urgent needs in my opinion which is needed and i think there can be no better forum than the one we are having here the auditorium is full people have come from far flung uh, from all over and they all need to think about it and uh, design the curriculum by which we can uh, take this subject to all over uh, the the subject which you have put it on the background is very relevant how can we deliver to the society nothing better can be there and i think if this uh, can be gauged and it it can be uh, if it can percolate to the society in the best of ways i don't think there can be any other better cause which will be served other than what you're going to have and uh, i'll be very pleased if some part of society gets the benefit out of this when i joined here i was uh, rather surprised that in pondicherry jail for the last 40 years there has been no psychologist who has ever visited i said what is it you we need to send the psychologist counselors to them so that they can talk to them and uh, show them the best possible way and not only that if our researchers will go there they'll get wonderful ideas about their own research problems which can which one can carry out but then this is what we have started i don't know how far we'll succeed but as i said i'll again repeat because what i learned in my own formative years when i was in college that if you have to put across an idea into somebody's mind particularly youngsters who are sitting here 
you have to repeat, say that loudly, clearly again and again, probably that's why I'm repeating, that you need to think of the ways and means by which we can popularize this subject all over. There are books, people will read all kind of journal books when it comes to psychology, they shy away for some reasons, I don't know. So this is what is required to be conveyed to the society, that here is an area which is as important as religion is. Many of us will follow all other practices, we'll pray, we'll preach, but when it comes to this, you'll find that this is as good as uh, praying. So once you can know your own self, I think there can be nothing better, and this is an area which will help you. I am very grateful to the association here that they have chosen Pondicherry as one of the venues uh, for holding this particular conference. Uh, when it came to us, I immediately said yes, because this is the thing. And uh, I said yes, because it will give a chance to everybody to explore Pondicherry. Those, who have, those of you who have come for the first time, you will find this is a lovely city. It's a, uh, it's a city which is to be appreciated from all sides. Very positive, very spiritual, pollution free, with good culture, very clean. So the moment you enter the boundaries of Pondicherry, I've been emphasizing all along, some kind of a positivity will set into your mind. You feel rejuvenated the moment you enter here. And you don't get tired. You feel like working. You feel like going on and on. So you'll, 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 you'll find this here during your stay. Those who have come for the first time, I wish them a very happy stay here. But those who are coming again and again, uh, that's one of the things which I've been emphasizing, that this is a city where one would love to come again and again. So that's what it is. I wish the conference a grand success. I will urge all the youngsters who are sitting here that you, this is one of the rare opportunities which you all will have to interact with some of the best in the field. So don't spare them. Don't let them have lunches and dinners comfortably. Interact with them. Make best use of this time so that you can grow further in your research areas. That's what, a, what, what one of the aims of a conference like this is. I wish the conference a grand success and congratulate my colleague, Professor Shivnath Deb, once again, because he got this award out of a huge lot of entries of about uh, 248 from all over, which is no mean achievement. And this also speaks about, uh, in volumes, about the vibrancy and the brilliance with which our uh, small department is showing its presence all over. Thank you so very much for choosing this venue, and I hope this will be a wonderful grand success. I wish all the best to everybody here. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir, for your very encouraging exhortation, and we uh, believe that you are equally as enthusiastic as any other psychologist here present here today for the development and also the promotion of psychology as a discipline. And indeed, the psychology department at Pondicherry University is very fortunate to have someone like you as our vice chancellor. And uh, in addition to the exhortation, I would like to request our vice chancellor, Professor Gurmit Singh, to release the book of abstracts for us. Good morning. Most respected uh, Professor Gurmit Singh, the most dynamic vice chancellor of the university we have, and uh, Professor Meva Singh, Professor Narayan Srinivasan, <coughs> Professor Manas Mandal, Professor Surendra Shia, Professor Sonali Dev, and Dr. Barani Kant, and all esteemed uh, research persons, participants for this uh, 29th annual convention of National Academy of Psychology, India. At the outset, I must thank the organizing team for thinking of me to, for participating in this uh, inaugural program of this well-attended conference. I'm indeed honored, and it's my pleasure to be in this August <coughs> inauguration of this program among all the dignitaries. As we know, in uh, health sciences, my background, all of us know that mental health 
is one of the most important uh, component that is being now addressed by the government of India. Mental health is given a lot of importance and strategy by being planned to develop this mental health across all the institute in India. This is because of the fact that we have a growing population of more than 1.3 billion populations. And second, the morbidity due to mental health varies from different spectrum of populations, being a children or adolescents or young adults or aging populations. So to this, we have many issues to be addressed. First and foremost being that there is extreme shortage of manpower. As for the World Health Organization recommended numbers, we should have at least three medical psychiatrists for every one lakh populations. But at the moment, we do have even less than one, 0.75 psychiatrists for one lakh populations. And second thing, in health science sector, when we think of psychiatry, this is mostly curative. Most of us, most of the psychiatrists, clinical psychiatrists, they spend a lot of time, most of the time, on curative aspect of psychiatrists. We can't blame anybody because so much of they are overworked. In the process, lot of preventive psychiatrists, or psychiatry or the society are being completely neglected. This is most important because when we think of the growing population, there is a difference of populations which need different attentions, preventive attentions. India, with one la 130 lakhs of populations, aging population has become a major challenge. And we are the country which we are proud of being the youngest populations. Young adults are there. And growing adults and children are there. And when we like to assess, their problems are different. So it's a big challenge. How to address various health problems, mental health problems among this different spectrum of the populations. So there is a great need for preventive aspects. And I wish there should be a strong forum, but platform, which will provide strong collaborations between the medical psychiatrist and all our psych applied psychiatrists in India. They must devise the strategies, how to address various issues pertaining to mental health among the children, adult populations, and aging populations. Because as all of you know, problems are very different. And instead, in our health sciences, many of us are confined to address the problems of illness in the pop populations. But even we are neglecting these psychiatric problems in the population suffering from non-communicable disease, like people suffering from cancer, people suffering, suppose, after heart attack, being debilitated and bedridden for one or two months, or from chronic diseases. It needs to be addressed. These need to be studies. What is their mental health at which status? And similarly, in the communities, we have to address to the people the various facets of this psychiatry and the psychology. Because in this reality, as Professor Gurmus Singh has told, people don't like to come to the hospital for treatment of psychiatric illness because still it's a social stigma. But one campaign should be made that mental health and psychiatric illness are completely different. The way we take all the preventive measures for having physical health, not to suffer from d disease like diabetes, hypertension, or no, any non communicable disease, or infectious disease. Similarly, there should be a campaign which should be launched to prevent increasing morbidity if we don't follow these principles. I wish there should be a system in the curriculum which not only focus and the restrict the apply psychologists to be in the classroom, but they should make the opportunity to come out of their classroom and more, more spend more time to the society. They should understand their problems.
and depending on the particular geographic area which varies to vary, they must address the issues. I'm so happy to know this theme that making psychology deliver to the society. I think this is most relevant and timely because this will contribute a lot to preventive psychiatry which is being completely neglected in this part of the country. Again, I must thank the organizing committee for inviting me here. It was a really wonderful experience to see all of you here. And the Pondicherry University is known for hospitality, particularly under the dynamic leadership of Professor Gurmut Singh. I am confident not only you will have a good experience, but you will have a good academic deliberations that will lead, that will suggest some ways and means to address social relevant issues of mental health and the ways how you can address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us on the clinical and the medical uh, aspects of uh, psychology and the relationship with psychiatry. We are delighted to have you here and we are honored to uh, be uh, graced by your presence here with us today on this occasion. Professor Mehwa Singh is an alumni of Punjab University, Chandigarh. He has been trained and he even taught at the Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. He is a Fulbright Scholar in Residence at Bucknell University, Pennsylvania, and also a visiting fellow at Zoological Society of San Diego, USA, and a visiting fellow at the German private center Gottingen and Cologne Zoo in Germany. Uh, summer professor in Germany, visiting lecturer in Malaysia, and professor at Russian Academy of Sciences, Moscow. Uh, I will not go into all the details because I can speak about Sir one whole day and not even get tired even after doing that. Personally, he has been a godfather to me, a mentor, and a friend to me. Uh, I was his student at the University of Mysore and continue to be his student and his friend even today. And it is a delight to have him here today in our midst. And sir, I give you the time. I'll not take much of your time. We would love to hear you speak rather than me talking. Communities and friends, I'll just take, uh, I think, one and a half minutes. That's how we planned. It's a great pleasure to introduce the incoming president. It's our tradition that the outgoing president should introduce the new president or the incoming president. It's indeed a great pleasure to introduce this person who is not only a great scholar, but a very close friend of mine, Professor Narayan Srinivasan, as most of you know. Narayan presently teaches at Center of Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences at uh, Allahabad. He has such a varied background. He is BE and ME -E in Electrical Engineering from none, none of the places, you know, from Indian Institute of Science, Science Bangalore. Then he left engineering. And he went to US, joined Department of Psychology at the University of Georgia, where also I have a lot of connections. I have been going there for, for, for many time, many years. And he joined psychology department, did his master's in psychology, did his PhD in psychology, especially in the area of cognitive sciences. Then he was a postdoc at University of Louisville. Then he went to teach in Italy, then he went to teach in Singapore. So with such a background, then he came back to India and joined uh, uh, the school at uh, Allahabad, where he's been mentoring the students. and enormous amount of research, 170 research, 187 research papers put together with all book chapters and, uh, and, uh, and so on. I mean, I would have personally given up another half an hour, 45 minute speech on his work because I'm very thorough uh, with his work, but poor thing, I'll be preempting his speech, then he will have nothing to speak. So I won't say anything about, about, about his work. This is, this is a great pleasure. He is also a member of a fellow of several prestigious societies and uh, associations. He's a, he's a fellow of the psycho, psycho, International Psychological Sciences. He's a fellow of Psychonomic Society. And he is a fellow of the National Academy of Psychology India. He's a now, now fellow. So it's indeed a pleasure. He's also very much experienced in the activities of NAOP. 
he has served in now in various capacities as especially as a secretary general for something like th three or four four years continuously he was the secretary general so he knows ins and outs of uh, now and i'm very glad that i'm handing over the chairmanship to a person who is abler than me and would carry out the activities of the now much better than me welcome narayan and i invite you to deliver the address thank you very much okay um dignitaries on the dais uh, my friends and colleagues and students uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and give the presidential address um hope you will find it interesting uh, so without wasting time let me get to the talk um, i'm going to uh, as you can see the title or two systems too many um I'm going to give you the answer also, so even if you leave in the middle, you know the answer. I think it is too many, okay? So you can leave now. Um, psychology is full of this. Uh, it has been, uh, if you look at the past history of psychology for 100 years, you will find these dichotomies. Emotion versus cognition, right? There is supposed to be an emotional system, there is supposed to be a cognitive system, and presumably they sometimes don't like each other. Um, then you have the famous conscious versus unconscious distinction. So there is a conscious system, there is an unconscious system, and uh, they have different properties. Uh, if you have done 1970s cognitive psychology, there is the famous Atkinson and Schifrin model. Uh, you will have this notion of controlled versus automatic systems. So one system is supposed to be controlled, another supposed system is supposed to be automatic. Uh, sometimes people use this term intuitive versus deliberative. There is supposed to be one intuitive system, one deliberative system. And sometimes people use a, a more neutralish terms like this, system one, system two. So we have all these two system dichotomies. Uh, some of them are kind of synonymous. They are all related to each other, not exactly same. But you will find this a lot in the literature. Not only in the literature, you will even find it among people, popular press, popular articles, and so on, right? A famous example of it, I'm going to say, this is from Professor Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, a great scientist who worked on works on decision making, won the Nobel Prize for economics. And in his book, of course, he talks about two systems as well. Uh, for those of you who do not know, I'm sure most of you know about it. System one is supposed to operate automatically and quickly, uh, no, with little or no effort, no sense of voluntary control. Okay, it's very fast, it's not controlled. And system two is slow, deliberative, it involves attention, it is effortful, and system two is, of course, often associated with our sense of agency, choice, and so on. And presumably, whatever decisions we take is some, some combination of the two systems. And that's why the, the book is itself is named Thinking Fast and Slow, that there are actually two systems. Can you hear me? Fast and slow. Uh, in the literature, of course, you have different kinds of debates about, where, about the two systems. So one question people ask is, which system is better? If you want to take a decision, uh, which system is better? And some people say that intuition is better for certain easy things, uh, associations. The more deliberative system is really better for very complex real life decisions that we take, where to do PhD, whom to get married with, I don't know, all these big decisions. Um, in the literature recently, some people have made uh, a bold claim. The claim is that it's actually the intuitive system that is supposed to be better if you actually have to make a complex decision. The reason is the unconscious is supposed to be very powerful. It has no capacity limitations. And you can do whatever it's outside of consciousness. In fact, the standard picture I've seen in internet and people use is that you have this iceberg or the mountain, there is this water, and there is a tip above the water level, uh, which is presumably the conscious, and there is a huge thing under the surface, which is the unconscious. A uh, lot of people carry this, are equivalent mental pictures in their head 
about the unconscious, that it's really very powerful. And many people, including people like Daisho Hughes, have argued that if you are faced with a complex decision, don't think deliberately, intuitively, whatever comes to your mind, you know, take the decision. This is like, you know, you know, isn't that people say love at first sight or something? I guess perhaps something like that. Um, so uh, they published a paper in Science, uh, very famous. Uh, they called it the deliberation without attention effect. Essentially, the basic idea is something you see on the graphs there. There are two uh, kinds of problems, one in which only four dimensions or four aspects are involved, one in which 12 aspects are involved. These are the simple versus complex problem situations. And people were asked to essentially either think about the problem for a few minutes or think about something else, not think about the problem. That is presumably the intuitive condition or the unconscious condition. And their argument is that, which you will see on the side, is that the unconscious system is actually better when it comes to more complex problems. So the intuitive, unconscious thought is supposed to come up, you can use it to come up with better decisions. A side story is that this effect, even though it's published in science, uh, like the replication crisis we have in psychology, this is also one part of it. Uh, we have a lot of failed replications of this basic effect. Um, so with my student, I saw him sitting somewhere there. Um, we did this work a few years ago where we looked at the kind of assumptions that people make about unconscious thought, is it really valid? Do we really may need to make these assumptions? So we'll just pick one assumption, and that is the fact that unconscious thought is supposed to have unlimited capacity in comparison to conscious thought. And presumably, uh, the weighting, the way in which you combine information is supposed to be more optimal if you use unconscious thought. And the second aspect I will not talk too much about, but something we study uh, about the, the way in which attention is conceptualized and used in talking about conscious versus unconscious thought. Uh, what we did is, uh, actually is not an experiment, what I have put here uh, are results from set of four simulations. Uh, the way in which the simulations were done is on the right. Essentially, there are two issues here. How do you sample information? out there, uh, that's one part. Second, after having sampled information from whatever is coming, how do you combine them? What you see are four different algorithms. The details are not important, uh, but we can discuss it if somebody is interested offline. But the basic idea is that irrespective of which algorithm you do, and all you need to see is that there is one graph that goes up and then kind of eventually reaches a maximum, the other three go down, okay? These are four choices, four cars, four houses, four mobile phones, or whatever you may want to think of. The basic idea is that if you see as the number of attributes increase, then the optimal choice is essentially what is made using any one of these four algorithms. The specific details are not important. The other thing I want you to notice is that by the time you get to three or four attributes, one is much better than the other three. Okay? That's the only point that you need to notice. Now, let me show you a comparison. Uh, at the top, you have a table from three different experiments done, actually on four cars, imaginary cars. And you can see the kind of values there. The Hatsdun car, is the best out of the four, and 58% of the subjects prefer it, 43% in Neville's 2008 experiment, 63% in Hatch-Jones experiment, okay? This uses the same deliberation without attention, unconscious thought paradigm. What, we have, what you see at the bottom are the simulation results, and all I want you to see is if you pick any three attributes out of 12 randomly, and then take a decision, the kind of results the algorithm gives you in a simulation is exactly what you get behaviorally, which simply means that you don't have to assume a powerful unconscious that gets all the information about all 12 attributes and somehow combines it under this threshold of consciousness and then comes up with the answer. 
You don't even need to make that assumption. Even an algorithm that randomly picks three combines, and if you do this, you get results with four attributes. We, the, the algorithm, four attributes randomly picked, still does better than whatever the behavioral results we get. So the assumption that somehow the unconscious is powerful, gets all the information and somehow combines it and comes up with an optimal decision is, we think, is unwarranted. Subsampling, which is essentially when a lot of information is present, you really sample only a small amount of information and then you combine, can be done with a very limited capacity system. I'm not going to say whether it is conscious or unconscious, but at least the kind of assumptions that are made about the unconscious uh, doesn't come from the data. Though. Okay? So all the results show in the lab is that only a few in pieces of information are combined, taken, combined to take a decision. Okay, let me move quickly. Um, is somebody monitoring time? Please let me know. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of studies, both related to uh, moral decision making or pro social behavior, because the question slightly changes here. The question is, if you have two systems, system one, system two, then which is better, which is the good system? In the sense, if you want to take a decision in a pro-social situation, cooperation, donation, helping other people, which system comes into play, right? Or at least more comes into play. Uh, again, this dual process framework is the dominant framework in moral decision-making research, okay? Uh, that's the majority view. What I'm actually going to presenting is the minority, okay? So apparently the pro-social decisions depend on the fast, relatively intuitive, automatic, effortless, emotional system, uh, and not really on, or less on the deliberative, controlled, slow, effortful system. So what constitutes evidence for it? Uh, there is a particular hypothesis by many people like Joshua Green and others. They, called it, they call it the social heuristic hypothesis. The basic idea is intuition facilitates cooperation. So if you want to cooperate, rely on your intuition. Okay, don't deliberate. Then you become very calculative and you will not cooperate. Okay, that's the basic idea. So behavior typically advantageous is, is automatized as a social, social heuristic and that is the intuitive response. Deliberation, by contrast, is much more calculative. You look at optimal benefits and costs, and depending on that only, you will take a decision and perform appropriate actions. Uh, people have studied it using many things. I have one example here. It's a public goods game. The basic idea of a public goods game is very simple. There are four people who play the game. Each of them put in some money. And whatever they put in money, you multiply it by constant, like two, and then it will be equally shared among all four, whatever the result is. If you play this game, for those who know the game, iteratively, again and again, people start free riding. Because if I don't put also anything, still if other three people put in, then I still get one fourth of what the other three have put in, without me putting in anything. So that's, that is the benefit, right? So if you play this game iteratively, uh, whether using a computer or individuals, people start free riding. Uh, you know, they don't contribute anymore. But right now I'm going to talk about a study with this one-shot single trial anonymous game. And what was done is essentially to tap into the intuitive versus deliberative system, a particular manipulation was used. And that manipulation was time. It's a fairly commonly used manipulation in the lab. The basic idea is you'll be given 10 seconds. So in the fast condition, or what is called time pressure condition, subjects will be asked to make a decision within 10 seconds. Do you want to put in money? How much do you want to put in? You have to take the decision within 10 seconds. In the other condition, the time delay condition, you are asked, wait, don't respond immediately, take your own time, think about it, and you are supposed to respond only after 10 seconds, okay? The, all, the logic being, the intuitive system is fast, so when you are asked to respond within 10 seconds, it is the intuitive system that will dominate, 
And if it is after 10 seconds, then it is the more deliberative system that will dominate. What's the finding? The finding is something you see there. Uh, it was again published in Science, I, I think, or Nature. Nature. Um, people put in more money, gave more money in the, for the public goods came in the time pressure condition, which is the blue bar, compared to the time delay condition, which is the red bar. Okay. So they concluded that intuitive system, intuition facilitates cooperation, in con consistent with that social heuristic hypothesis. Uh, after this replication crisis and all that, a uh, lot of people have started making multi-labs coming together uh, internationally, many labs, and then trying to replicate various findings in psychology. Uh, one such effort was made for this particular effect, and uh, somewhere you will see Srinivasan in the table, doesn't matter. Uh, 21 labs participated in this multi-lab replication study, including Allahabad, and the basic result is uh, the effect was not replicated across all the 21 labs. There are two different conditions though. This condition is irrespective of whether, even though they were instructed to respond within 10 seconds, they actually responded or not. You get a very slight effect, at least on an average, although the Allahabad one still did not show any difference. Um, if you take people only who followed instructions, who were compliant, okay? So the compliant one only analysis showed a very small effect, not as large as the original effect, but if you look at subjects as a whole, there was no effect. Uh, we kind of followed it up because the subjects in Allahabad we found were um, more, compared to even the other 20 labs, actually were not that compliant. Even though we told them to respond within 10 seconds, a lot of subjects found it very hard to do that they actually took a bit longer than 10 seconds, okay? So what we did was, okay, we should redo this study again, so make people more compliant and still check whether this effect still persists. And then we also looked at various individual differences parameters, and they are given there. One is uh, uh, to measure their temporal discounting, uh, kind of uh, whether they go for a small immediate reward versus wait for the large delayed reward. Um, that kind of a task. We looked at their attention in terms of a, what is called a global local task, whether people are globally biased or locally biased. We gave a personality test and there was a value questionnaire and all that. I will just talk about a couple. Um, well, the first thing, again, no, again, it's a null effect. We did not find any difference between the time delay condition and the time pressure condition. Um, in fact, if you see the base factors, you will see the values are 17.68 and 6.225, even if you look at, do the compliant only analysis, which means there is a reasonably strong evidence for the null hypothesis. That is, there is really no difference between the two conditions, which means the underlying assumption that there are two separate systems, they are used, and two different decisions are made is really questionable, okay? There is really no evidence, at least in these kinds of tasks. Okay. Um, we have continued to look at this issue in terms of decision making in moral situations and trying to question the dual process framework and then see that exactly what are the factors that may be important rather than thinking about it in terms of two systems. So I'm going to present one experiment with one factor. But before I do it, uh, this is a problem I think if you are familiar with moral decision making. Um, most of you may know. If you do not know, it's called the trolley problem. Essentially, there is a trolley that is coming. Uh, there are two uh, lines you see there. And then a subject is, has a choice to push the lever. If you push it, uh, if you don't do anything, five people will die. If you push the lever, well, one person is die. Okay, so the question is, what will you do? Uh, more than 50%, a reasonable majority, in this case, answer yes. There are differences and there is also a multi-lab replication currently, I think have been started for this trolley problems as well. But dental finding is that a lot of people will say, okay, I will press the lever. If you change the problem this way, which is called the bridge problem, where essentially a fat person is standing there, there are five people lying on the line, and then 
the question is, the subjects are asked, would you push this fat person? Remember, in terms of utilitarian calculations, it is still one versus five. You sacrifice one to save five people. In this case, though, interestingly, even though the, the calculations, one versus five is exactly the same, most people actually say, no, I will not push this fat person, even though it is one versus five. Now, again, this, people have looked into this predominantly using the dual process framework. Uh, there are, you will see two classifications there. One, the, like the fat person problem is called a personal dilemma. This is just a terminology. Uh, we, in this case, people presumably make deontological responses. I, it is not a good thing. I'm not supposed to do this. Push a fat person, somebody, a human being, onto the railway line. Tend not to harm few to save many, and presumably it's driven by the fast, intuitive, emotional system one. You have the impersonal dilemmas. This is the lever problem, the first example I showed you. People generally tend to make utilitarian responses, okay? So if it is one versus five, it's better to sacrifice one to save five people. Tend to harm a few to save a many. And it's a deliberative process, presumably system two of Daniel Kahneman is involved in this. What we looked at is the notion of control. Um, many of you will be familiar with this. How much control you have over your actions and its consequences, we think it's an important factor and probably uh, more important than the kind of system one, system two dichotomy that people use. So we manipulated personal control. We also manipulated the nature of dilemma, personal versus impersonal. So two factorial repeated measures design. Uh, we gave people 20 dilemmas, not just one dilemma, and asked people what you will do, okay? The control was essentially, think of, uh, this is pictorially, uh, another person standing there and then trying to influence you, okay? Violently or not. So this person can stop you. In that case, it's a low control situation. Or this person can say, okay, okay, go do it, fine. And that would be the high control situation, okay? What are the results? If it's a personal dilemma and the perceived control is low, 49.3, uh, around 50% of the time people took the action or said they will take the action. When it's a personal dilemma but now control is higher, more number of people now said, okay, I will take the action, around 67%, not surprising. The impersonal and the low control condition, 63%, and the impersonal and high person, uh, control is 72.24. Now, if you look at the actual effects, well, both the, we, we got two main effects, essentially. What you see are the percent odds or the odd ratios. Um, you the interaction effect is not significant, but the two main effects are significant. So the nature of the dilemma mattered, but control also had an effect. But what we were interested in, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to see there with their uh, railings, are two conditions we were actually interested in. These two things kind of pit one versus each other if you look, focus on two of the four conditions. The personal dilemma tells you, if you look at the literature, you don't take the action. High control tells you take the action. So these two things are pitted one versus the other. In the other case, the impersonal dilemma tells you to take the action. The low personal uh, perceived control tells you to not take the action. So the question is, which one is stronger? So if you see this, the high, even though it's a personal dilemma, it, which we, this is the fat person problem, when the control is high, more number of people are willing to take the action than even though it's an impersonal dilemma, but now the control is low. This is a significantly different effect. So control seems to be much stronger factor here than the liver versus fat person type of situation, okay? So let me conclude. Uh, while the notion of two systems have become very widely entrenched in psychology, and I find even people outside psychology talk about the unconscious and the conscious, um, people always criticize the word consciousness uh, if you are familiar with psychology history. Uh, if you cannot define consciousness, you cannot define unconsciousness as well. 
If it is an opposite of it, you cannot have a definition of that as well. Uh, essentially, what is undefinable, people simply say it's unconscious taking over and does something, okay? So I think it's really time that we focus more on various specific factors that affect and not these dichotomies of unconscious versus conscious, which is of course more than 100 odd years old. Uh, and the notion of powerful unconscious, at least in uh, cognitive psychology, I do, the evidence for it is actually, to be precise, non-existent or very minimal, okay, in spite of its popularity. So there is need to identify very specific processes or factors like control uh, that may vary along a continuum and not simply think in terms of two systems and then see how we actually take our decisions in real life, okay? Thank you, and let me acknowledge Sumit, Revati, and Shiva Labha who did all the study and people who funded this research. Thank you. Pleasure and privilege to be amongst you to this morning. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, there is no luxury of uh, using time to address all of you about uh, what I'm going to speak. Rather, I would try to run through because uh, there are shortage of time. I'll take 15 minutes. There are about seven to eight slides only, no issue. I would rather try to use more than my knowledge, my experience, in working in three kinds of environments where I taught psychology or being a student of psychology. Actually, I taught uh, over a decade in a university system, which is Banaras Hindu University, psychology. And then I taught over a year, over, over a decade in IIT system, and then over a decade in R&D system. So three systems I work with in psychology, and I have seen how psychology is growing, and uh, how there is a possibility to work with other disciplines, particularly uh, in the other fields of social sciences, as well as with the sciences which involve computational science as well as neuroscience. So my idea will be here to talk about uh, that what I have seen uh, the way psychology is being run in different disciplines, in different institutions. So whatever I have noticed in the last 40 years is that uh, we, have a, we have several kinds of approaches to understand psychology through basic psychology, through to directed basic psychology, to applied psychology, to translational psychology, to end user integration psychology, in various ways. I mean, let me first iterate uh, what I wanted to mean by that. Well, the, in any science, when the knowledge grows, the knowledge grows from, I mean, in seven different layers. No knowledge to new knowledge, new knowledge to theory building, theory building to principles of application, principles of application to discovery of solution, discovery of solution to translation, translation to production, production to optimization, optimization to end user integration in any science because mostly I worked with medical professionals and engineers throughout my career. Any science that I have seen, there are three kinds of sciences in this world, physical sciences, which, uh, uh, I mean, within natural science, we have got physical sciences and life sciences. We have got social sciences and we have got formal sciences. Formal science is a mathematical science based on which we develop model. And uh, using those models, we actually do a lot of researches. <coughs> so the idea is that in the university system, I found mostly we have done basic researches and those researches are from trying to uh, mostly passion-driven researches and where we are more interested in understanding the process and any psychological concept we try to develop in the form of a construct. So no knowledge to new knowledge and new knowledge to theory building and theory building to principles of application is a process which I saw in the university system we are trying to deliver it to the society by filling up that knowledge gap. In the IIT system, we found we start from principles of application to discovery of solution and discovery of solution to translation. And this translation, mostly in the engineering sciences and psychology department, our idea was to 
do some kind of prototype development. It may be a test development, it may be an instrument development, it could be any kind of development, it's a deliverable development. And the deliverability uh, is ensured that, well, it becomes a tabletop prototype. And when I came to <coughs> R&D system, like in DRDO system, I found that they do not stop at the tabletop production level or prototype system. They go by a production ready prototype system and from there, how the product can be made most optimized, and from optimization to end user integration. So the question is, from, from university system to IIT system to DRDO system to R&D system, I also worked with the industries in these spheres. I found psychology has been progressing in various different spheres. But the problem is that our connectivity is much less. So my first slide simply tells that how blue, school, blue sky researches are done, how pure basic research is done, how directed basic research is done, how applied research is done, how experimental development research is done, how translational research is done. I have not included optimization because that's more done in engineering researches, and then how end user integration researches are done. <coughs> Sorry. So, this is the different seven layers of uh, science, seven layers of researches that we try to do in order to make our science deliverable to the society. <clears throat> but when we reached, when we try to look into psychology as such, we find that, like what Professor Narayanan has said, that we also have a system one, system two type of dilemma. And the dilemma is whether I should do research more in the passion-driven manner or in a purpose-driven manner whether I should do a product research or a process research, whether I should do a research in a multidisciplinary manner or a transdisciplinary manner, whether I do research as a basic research or a translational research, or whether I do a structured research or an autonomous research. The point I'm trying to make here is that in order to make psychology deliverable, we have to understand these systems. And this passion-driven, process-driven, multidisciplinarity, Basic research, structured research, all are prevalent. Mostly 90 to 95 percent of our researchers are going in these directions. What I'm trying to hint here in 29th and now is to make psychology <coughs> deliverable. In order to make it a purpose-driven research that let us have a social purpose, any purpose that we have. Let us have a purpose. Let us have a product. In any product, a test is a product. Let us not think that only a tangible product is a product. We can have a product. We can have more transdisciplinarity. We can have more translational approach. And we can have more autonomous research. Autonomous research, I'll come at the end of it. But before I go to transdisciplinarity, let me on only tell for my students that there is a big difference between multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity in any science. I'm not referring to psychology. In any science, because I worked mostly with the engineers, doctors, and as well as as a student of psychology. When we talk about multidisciplinarity, we actually develop a concept and derive concepts from many other sciences, and then try to stay within our own limit before we actually make a conclusion. But when we do interdisciplinary research, we share data, we share methodology, and then we try to harmonize link amongst them. But actually, transdisciplinary research is very limited. Unless we do that, probably translational research is not possible. In transdisciplinary research, we actually sacrifice our boundary, our subject boundary. We actually develop a new methodology which is not in vogue, which is not the property of a given subject matter. So the idea of doing transdisciplinarity is very, very important in order to make psychology deliverable to the society. So to go beyond, I quickly just show it to you that what do I mean by that? The slides would be available. As I said, this is not drawn from any sources. You can make use of it. But my hint is that let us be more, more and more transdisciplinary. I'll give some examples. What President Narayanan was telling about Daniel Kahneman, then Richard Thaler, all these people have developed their psychological sciences through economics platform. And they developed behavior economics as a transdisciplinary science. So it goes beyond the traditional psychological sciences. 
and their nudge theory, their system one, system two, decision making theories, all derived from psychological sciences originally. But they got a different platform, created a new methodology and come out with a transdisciplinary science. Likewise, recently I was reading a book of biology of belief. The understanding is that our belief system, if I am negative in belief system, my health will go down. What sir was telling about mental health, my health will go down. Recently we found in as a, I mean, Bruce Lipton, a molecular biologist actually, he got this great uh, knowledge to, to us that if I am negative, which are those vital organs getting affected? And why we develop, why we damage our own system if we have a negative orientation, negative feeling. So biology of belief has become a subject matter which has become truly transdisciplinary, which tells that how the protein unfolding is done based on the environmental input and how you perceive others. We have other discipline, humanoids, because I work with engineers, I find that humanoids where the computing system, where the autonomous system are actually developing certain forms of human element. And humanoids are getting very strongly from cognitive sciences. Therefore, all these issues that I am trying to tell you that, uh, well, Professor Narayanan has been working uh, with functional magnetic resonance imaging. We find that every psychological process has a biological vertical. Now, if every psychological process has a biological vertical, a genetic vertical, a psychological vertical, a, psych a interpersonal vertical, a cultural vertical, an ecological vertical, why not we come together and understand the process more uh, strongly rather than trying to understand what my subject only tells. So unless this transdisciplinarity starts, probably we'll not be doing a justice to our psychological science. My next point is to talk about how to make things translational. Because unless we translate our knowledge into a product, any product, it can be an intangible product, it can be a service, but let that be a product, that just not be a process. So findings from the basic sciences that are useful for practical applications are more important today. So those who would be taking up PhD program, why not you think of uh, uh, taking up something which is deliverable? Let there be a very low permeability, I mean low barrier, thin barrier between science and practice. As long as science and practice, the barrier is low, probably we are not going to do good justice. So if we allow this incremental growth, I mean, I have my uh, recent experience with the DRDO in DIPR, one of my colleague and with, uh, uh, I mean, some other scientists, we developed a once in lifetime system for Air Force pilots. Now, Air Force pilots uh, are selected based on once in lifetime system, the photograph that you see. And the system tells that you can train yourself a thousand times, you will not be able to improve a single point out of it. That is, by having this system as a product, today we are saving several crores of foreign ex uh, money for the country. And it is worth of over 200 crore. By having a psychological test, we call it CPSS, the Computerized Pilot Selection System. You would not believe that a pilot handles a five crore ha um, uh, rupees um, uh, worth of uh, fighter plane. If he is completely not error free, we cannot afford to give him that. And the whole process of selection is purely psychological nothing else. So when I went to uh, technology institutions, I found that, well, there is a big gap going on the technology development and human skill development. Because technology grows every day, human skill doesn't grow every day. And what is happening? We are creating two kinds of system. One is technology-enabled cognition or capability. Other is cognition-enabled technology. So actually, we are moving from augmentation of human capability to automation through engineering sciences, ultimately to autonomy. So once autonomy comes over, then probably our cognition would not be needed. The cognition which has been needed is of machine cognition. So a lot of machine uh, algorithms, machine learning, deep learning uh, techniques are coming up in order to simulate human uh, system. So we, 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 we were developing uh, several pathways for us, how to reinforce human capability. So we were trying to develop a 360 degree vision for people. We all have a 180 degree vision, but if I give a soldier 360 degree vision with a helmet, will he be able to cognize it? What would be the pressure, what would be the system pressure, the brain pressure on him? Trying to evaluate, trying to understand how night vision takes place. Is it a cognitive science? Is it so that the, our system during night goes down? 
we see much less uh, uh, our cognitive process goes down during night. Is it so that we fail to detect camouflage because of certain inherent, inherent capabilities? So we try to reinforce human capability. We try to read human capability all through psychological principles and through certain deliverable engineering sciences. We try to restore human capability, like transcranial magnetic stimulation. Can we restore human capability, the capability to navigate, the capability to remain alert, what President Aranan was telling about attentional process. Can we do it uh, through certain deliverable system? Ultimately, the assessment of the system will come through validation through psychological process. Likewise, now people have been growing from cognition-enabled te um, technology now uh, towards that. Can we replace human capability? Bioalgorithm has come in a big way. All, all insights are coming from cognitive sciences. And the insights come from your sensation to perception to attention to learning to memory to problem solving to intelligence to decision making. It's all coming through cognitive sciences only. But where are we? The engineering sciences are moving very fast. So they are trying to even replicate a human system, like a UGV scanner, right? a robotic cognition with humanoids. So all these systems are coming up using psychological principles. Where do we stand? Finally, I would like to tell you about some research which is autonomous research. Autonomous translational, I have said, transdisciplinary, I have said. My final point is about autonomous research. Autonomous research is not done in laboratory. It is done in the field. Autonomous research is primarily an inductive form of research where the solution of a problem is not inherent within the problem. That is, autonomous research starts with a non-expert system. It doesn't start with a lot of knowledge because when we do research, we have got library, we have got infrastructure, we have got computer, we have got expert guide, we have got a lot of facilities. But when a person is in disaster, or when a person has got a problem in the society, everybody doesn't know psychology. And even if we don't, even if we know psychology, do we really help? Do we really understand people? Somebody asked this question to me in a village. Are you in a position to tell my mind? I said, we never uh, are in a position to tell your mind. At best, I can tell you about your mindset. So we really try to understand people's mindset rather than going into mind. So the question is, this, this autonomous research is an inductive research, is an iterative research. There is no stoppage here. You keep on growing here. In an in a engineered or a medical product, you stop somewhere. You develop a medicine, you stop somewhere. In an iterative <coughs> research, you keep on growing. They're all indigenous, they're all inexpensive, and they're all available around you. So the question of having, doing autonomous research, going to the ground, looking at people, talking to them, having qualitative input from uh, uh, the people's wisdom, which I say is a, is a community-based wisdom rather than organized knowledge. Now, organized knowledge we all get from Google, organized knowledge. But what about the community-based wisdom? Autonomous researches are those researches which come out of our uh, organized, uh, um, I mean, such kind of wisdom. What I have shown is your Richard Thaler's uh, experiment in a urinal, he got, he found that if a, if a, if a house fly is etched, the sweeping job reduces by 80%. Sorry about this, giving this example. And uh, it is reduced by, and he gave this example in his book on nudge. Question is, it is an autonomous research. Once I was uh, doing after 26-11 uh, Bombay attack, government asked me to do some research. So I found that uh, the, the input for a very good research came out of the ground. So I talk to people, they say, Ki we often tell that before mob hysteria takes place, if there is a mob hysteria or there is a mass hysteria, try to safeguard yourself first, then you try to save your child. In aeroplane also they say, you first protect yourself, then only you protect your child. He said that compassion kills more people than competition. This knowledge I would have never gotten in any book that compassion kills more people. So in order to stop stampede in a, in a crowd, it's better that you go for a public uh, announcement that try to safeguard yourself first before you try to save others. So in a collective society like ours, compassion comes first than competition. We, we die more uh, because of this compassion. So the knowledge is very important to understand how autonomous researches are done. How mobile phone, uh, I mean, it has become an addiction, we all know. 
Now Nimans has come up uh, with some department also. I was talking to the director. The question is, I mean, depression, so, uh, I mean, hysteria, mobile addiction, so many problems we are having. How many problems we are sorting it out? So autonomous research actually introduces new ideas, new services, alternative models to address societal problems. I found in MP, children have developed a good bathroom using 40 liter uh, um, bisleri bottle. They cut it to a, like a urinal uh, um, uh, pot and they used it with one liter uh, bottle, uh, the, the connectivity amongst those urinals. It's an excellent autonomous idea. The Prime Minister has given an award for that and it came in India today as well. Question is that by doing this, the society's capacity enhances. I get PhD through research, that's fine. But as long as it doesn't help the society, it doesn't make uh, the society uh, helped out of, uh, assisted out of it, it doesn't make things or make meaningful. My uh, last bit one slide tells that then what are my strengths as a psychologist, what are my weaknesses, what are my traits, and what are my opportunities? Being in the funding agency for so many years, I have also seen how uh, funding is getting wasted because we are not getting something which is worthwhile to be funded. One is that we have major strengths like domain knowledge. The we are theory-driven, of course theory-driven, but what Harry Trent is once said, that 80% of the theories are based on 20% of human population. I mean, that kind of situation is also creating problem for us. Heterogeneity in expertise we have, we have huge strength. Wide variety of research paradigm we use. We have excellent publishing, publication record. But problem kya hai? What is our problem? We all do low risk, low gain research. We, we, we have a bias for pro process than product. We, we, and this bias is good because psychology has grown because of this. Theory development was absolutely important for all of us. Otherwise, it would not have had a uh, status of uh, becoming a science. But the question is, now it is time that we move beyond process and look for the product. We go beyond low risk, low gain type of researches. I mean, um, we need to develop logistics, we need to develop heuristics, we need to develop tactics, we need to have refined statistics in order to ultimately go for such kind of researches. Let us have a few mega program. And there now, why can't we, if all big minds are here, we can have a mega program. Let there be the person who is running the mega program, let it be, let that person hibernate for some time. Let this project run in several corners and several centers. I run a happiness center in IIT Kharagpur and I found one research is going on for, uh, since 1938 in Harvard University on happiness. 1938 and it's con since continuing. It's a uh, fifth generation research they are doing on a program, what makes us happy? Is it money? Is it relations? Is it autonomy? Is it auto? Is it uh, our, our quality of life? What is that? It's still going on. So lack of deliverable outcome is our challenge, is our weakness. As a psychologist, we have to stop, I think, a prediction arch. As I said, we don't predict mind. We only predict some kind of mindset. Professional obsolescence is also a very big uh, problem because technology is developing. All other sciences are developing. If we don't develop, there would be a gap between the different kinds of sciences within social sciences gap uh, increasing and we would become professionally obsolete. Skill versus technology gap and let us not oversell because I found uh, while in DRDO to have a medicine developed to get a molecule which uh, and synthetically ultimately to develop our doctor friend can always tell it takes 25 to 30 years. We never try to uh, uh, I mean market a product before 30 years and it's a disincentive for doing research but no product is oversold, I mean, with a promise. So in psychological sciences, the quality assurance, the optimization, the end user integration, the ability to do mark one to mark two, we develop a test, I mean, a ways, uh, for example, then revised, they have done it. And I think uh, all these big shots in psychology, they spent years, life, in developing a test. They never oversold it. Question is, we have to stop overselling. And also, the opportunities are that 
there are good opportunities for doing transdisciplinary research, good opportunity now for doing translational approach, good opportunity for risk capital. I see it in the different funding agencies. I tell you, there is no dearth of funding, of, uh, funding uh, from any sources. Let us have good projects. There are a lot of uh, funding opportunities uh, within the country uh, is available. Let us have a good mega program. Let this be a high risk, high gain project. Let this be a high risk, high gain project. But let us see whether it is getting rejected or not. I do hope that there would be less of rejections. So many national missions, I do not belong to any political party. But we have so many um, national missions. If clean India is to be successful, health India is to be successful, you have to change people's mind. If you have to, and government is spending thousands of crores for uh, these missions. Any mission you talk about, clean India mission, we have spent several thousands in thousands uh, of crores I'm talking about. Well, what is our contribution? So I make presentations in planning commission and um, I mean, um, Niti Aayog at times. I find that they are not considering our contribution because we fail to actually change people's attitude towards uh, uh, a particular mission. Idea is that if we make psychology deliverable, I am sure we would be able to make uh, uh, change people's um, uh, orientation and attention towards the different missions that we have. We have Digital India Mission, we have Stand Up India Mission, we have Start Up. How many people of us are going for startups? We have Start Up India Mission, Stand Up India Mission, Digital India Mission, Health India Mission, Clean India Mission. So many missions we have. Thousands of crores are invested. Is it so that the project project are given only through funding agencies? There are so many other ways projects can be given, so many ways we can do uh, longitudinal studies. So finally, talking about the, this is my final slide, that how do we translate research pr product into deliverable is a big question. Do we have a template for interacting with other sciences? As long we become, don't become transdisciplinary, don't go beyond the comfort zone of our uh, of our own disciplines, own uh, domains, own boundaries, we would not be able to work with many. Because a university like Pondicherry University, so many departments we have, why can't different departments sit together and come out with a deliverable product? Is it possible to do quality certification of our product? Do we have a quality certification agency in India for the psychological test we do? There is no such. Now, Bark is asking, uh, the other day I was delivering lecture in Baba Atomic uh, Research Center. And they were asking, if you have a deliverable product to, uh, to detect inside a threat, I'll right away take, take it from you. I had no answer for that. So the issue is that for an engineered product, there are a lot of quality certification agencies. Do we have such quality certification agencies? How do we secure risk capital for long-term research is a big issue that beyond PhD also, if we have to continue, then how can we create generations so that the research continues? Can we undertake mega program with micro planning? Because now research funding agencies say, we always say that your project planning should be such that half of the project is already done before, you, before we actually fund it. So it should be a meticulous micro planning before actually you uh, uh, fund it. Once it is done, Rest assured that your project is through. And finally, can we protect our title? Engineers protect their titles. Medical doctors protect their titles. Do we protect our titles? Will somebody say that, uh, well, I made a mistake, your um, 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 designation would be protected, you are a psychologist? No, I'll go to jail first. Uh, my my uh, title is not protected. Question is, in order to protect uh, my title, we have to go beyond. We have to see uh, lights for tomorrow. So the answer, my final answer, is that let us, let us try to do something which can deliver to the society and let this forum be very vibrant. We have several forums in this country, Applied Psychology Forum, Clinical Psychology Forum, National Academy of Psychology as a forum. All these forums can actually contribute, create a mega program, and enter into the mindset of the government of the people, the academia, of the fraternity, that yes, we do have to contribute. Thank you so much. Great wishes.